In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Marianne's guests are leaders in their field, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in their own work. They teach others to develop, refocus and grow. Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. We have an amazing show lined up for you here today. We've got three amazing guests and a couple giveaways, so you want to stay tuned. Our first guest is Dr. Susan Edelman. She is a professor at Stanford University and a board-certified psychiatrist in private practice, specializing in women's issues. So let's welcome to the show Dr. Susan. Thank you so much for having me, Marianne. It's great to be with you today. Oh, it, what a delight it is to have you with us, and especially talking not just about your book, but um, in regards to women and dating, and again, and again, your book is Be Your Own Brand of Sexy, but you know, in regards to like women and dating, and how do we figure all this stuff out? It's so important because the rules are so confusing for women today. There are no rules, but then there's some unspoken rules. So I'm so happy to be with you to talk about this today. It's wonderful. Well, and my first question for you, I mean, I've got tons of questions, and gosh, we'll see how much we can get through today. We're definitely having you back next year as it comes a little bit closer to Valentine's Day because I just feel your information is so important. We, we definitely need to have you back. Um, what inspired you to write Be Your Own Brand of Sexy? There's a young woman who is a dear friend of mine's daughter, and she called me about her dating experience in college, and all the guys were asking her to come over and hang out. And she's like, Susan, what does that mean? And I wasn't really sure. But as it turns out, most of these guys wanted more of a hookup than than any kind of serious relationship and it was very disappointing for her and incredibly disappointing for me because I thought college dating was just wonderful. So I started to wonder what had happened to romance and courtship and she said, Susan, you have to do something about this. And I knew it wasn't just teenagers who were struggling because I've seen women of all ages have problems with these kind of relationships, so I thought maybe it's time to do something. Someone needs to. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad that you wrote this book. It is a game changer, and and you're right. I mean, women, it's so confusing what to do, what not to do. I mean, there, there are books out there that, you know, people have kind of made up rules, and I'm sure they're all fine and well, but you hear rules like, oh, you know, you know, they just are very interesting roles on courtship and what to do. And so I wanted you to kind of share with us what are some of the common mistakes that women use in sabotaging themselves in dating? You know, one of the major things that I see women do is they make excuses for men and they settle for things that they don't want. So, Maybe he comes late for the date and they said, oh, well, he, you know, he got stuck in traffic. Or maybe he won't make a commitment and they say, oh, well, his ex really did a number on him. He just needs more time. But they're really making excuses for the guy and not thinking about what they need. So that's a Mm -hmm. big problem. And the other thing that women do is they don't say no to things that they don't want. So maybe... The guy's inviting them to come over late at night, and she feels taken for granted, but she just goes anyway instead of not even answering the phone if it's late at night. Or, you know, if if a woman doesn't want to get involved with a guy who won't commit, then it's easy not to have sex with him. You can just say, I'm not into casual sex. So saying no is super important and the other mistake i see women do is they they don't appreciate the nice things that men do for them sometimes when we're taught you know you need need to be strong and independent we can be conflicted about whether it's okay for a man to help us 
should should we be doing it all ourselves? Uh, I've heard men tell me, one man told me that he opened a woman's door for her and, and she slapped him. So we don't, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think we want to be giving men these messages. I think we want to be really clear that if somebody's doing something nice for us, we love it. Oh, and, and, and appreciate it and really show them that, hey, that thoughtfulness really means a lot. You know, and, and that's one of the things that, in fact, you kind of touched on it a little bit, and it was one of the questions I had because, you know, a lot of times when women aren't, you know, saying what it is that they want, what have you found that that's, what's the main reason for that? Is it insecurity or not feeling comfortable in the relationship? Or what would cause a woman not to be able to just say, well, you know, I'm not okay with that. Maybe they don't know, you know, language, you know, appropriate language for that kind of a discussion. I, I do think part of it is language. That's why I came up with a new ebook of what to say on a date because mm-hmm. I think sometimes women are so nervous about how to say no that they don't know playful ways to say it or just simple ways to say it. So I think that language is one thing. And I think women are also sometimes afraid. They might be afraid of losing the guy. They might feel like it's not okay to stand up for what they want. Some women haven't been raised to stand up for what they want. So it may feel completely unfamiliar. They may not have any role models for it. So there are a whole, and confidence can be part of that. But I think a lot of people don't realize that sometimes the process of learning to stand up for yourself and actually doing it can give you more confidence. So you don't need confidence before you start the process. Well, and your book is a great place for women to start to get those, you know, those markers in the road so that they know they're on the right path and help them develop the skill set so that they're able to, you know, be able to be in a dating relationship and really get what it is that they want. Yes, it's so important to start the process and to be aware of if you're not getting what you want, if you're settling for less, because it, it, there are a lot of people who feel like they don't deserve it, even though they may not be conscious of that. They may be acting that way. Oh, well, that's probably a, a, a big thing to work through. Now, you touched on a piece about, you know, if the guy won't commit, and that was actually in in my wonderful list of questions here for you. <laughs> so, I mean, because there's a point where it's like, is this person, is this guy really into me? You know, you were talking about his his ex did such a number on him. You know, at what point do we let things play out or kick that relationship kind of to the curb? Well, I think that's a great question. And every woman's got to figure it out for herself. But Mm -hmm. there are things that you can do to make it more obvious to figure out whether a guy's into you or not. Because some women are doing a lot of the chasing, and so they never pull back enough to know if the guy will chase without those those things that she's doing. So I find that a lot of people feel like they've got to get involved right away. They can't slow things down. And so then they don't necessarily find out if the guy's into them until a few months later. So if you take your time and get to know someone, then – it, it usually works a lot better because you're finding out if, if he wants to keep driving the relationship and, and, if, and if he's really interested. So, and I think the other things are letting, letting him pay on the date or letting him make the phone calls to see because a lot of these women feel like, ooh, I have to text him back right away. I didn't hear from him today. Should I text him? And they don't give him a few days to write them. And that's the way you find out if a guy is interested. Is he continuing to contact you? And does he want to make it work? And also, don't have sex with him until you get the commitment you want. And then you do find out, right? Is he just in it for sex? Because then he's going to disappear. You don't have to make that decision. And if he's really into you, he's usually going to stick around. Maybe he's going to ask you. Why don't you want to have sex or what's going on? But that's okay. Yeah. You know, she can say, I'm just not into casual sex. You know, I want to get to know you better. And and in today's hookup culture, which is truly unfortunate, it really makes things confusing because a lot of times, 
it seems to me that that's kind of what is more like accept, you know, expected on the first few dates or, or the norm, and that's really not the case. I think that if it's expected from guys who are just looking for a hookup and guys who are looking for something a little more serious, they probably don't expect it. They probably still know. Uh, unless they're really young and they're, you know, really entrenched in a hookup culture. And I don't think that every culture is like that, but there are certain pockets of this where, you know, the men really feel like they don't have to do much to get a woman into bed with them, and the women feel a little desperate about, you know, how else are they going to have a relationship unless they have sex. So I don't think it's very empowering for women. I'm really worried about it. Well, and again, that's why your book is a great uh, a great starting place to kind of get those markers to know, hey, you know, what's appropriate for me, and then for women to make their decision on what it is that they truly want and moving forward from there. So, you know, and in, in you're, I mean, this is all just kind of going as always very smoothly. One of the things that I know that women sometimes have a problem with, and you touched on this a little bit, is when is it okay to have, you know, sex in a relationship? When is it okay to start doing that? Well, I think there's a few questions every woman should ask herself before she even thinks of having sex with a new man. Mm -hmm. And, And one of those is, does he want what I want? Because before you have sex with someone new, you really want to know if you're on the same page for your goals for the relationship. Do you both want something serious? Or is one or both of you just interested in a casual fling? And, you know, many people feel awkward discussing this topic before they have sex. But if you don't feel like you can talk about it, maybe you're just not ready to have sex. (laughs) You know, you want to get the answers you need so you're not sorry later. And the other thing that I find that women really need to ask themselves and be honest with themselves about is how am I going to feel if we have sex and he disappears? And, you know, it's just a realistic question because society may tell you that you should be able to just brush those feelings aside and move on because you're a modern woman, but many women just can't do that. I mean, I think casual sex works for some women, but I've talked to so many women who say, what's wrong with me? that I get attached when I have sex, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Our bodies are built for attachment. So the problem is that, you know, this thing is going on in our culture that really doesn't work for the way we're built. Mm. Well, and so with all this information in mind of kind of the things to, you know, look for and 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 kind of um, – you know, keep in mind as we're dating, what, you know, what are some of the attributes that make it possible for us to attract the ideal partner? Well, I think, I think the number one thing is to appreciate the man. That is mm-hmm. probably the most important thing. The other thing I think, uh, and, and usually appreciating what he does for you, the nice thing he, he thinks he does. Well, that's so sweet if he says something nice or if he opens your door and you like it, say, oh, I, that's so nice of you, you know, to even the, the really little things because you're encouraging him to do more and you're making it a very positive experience. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this expert on marriage, Dr. John Gottman. He's got like a marriage lab where he studies couples and who, you know, can survive the relationship and who doesn't. And his research shows that the couples that do better have like five positive interactions for every negative. So it's important to remember to try and keep things light and positive and not have these heavy conversations a lot of the time about things that you don't like, but to focus on the things that are working and the things that are positive and the things you enjoy to do together. Hmm. And, you know, and that just makes for a happy relationship for everybody. (laughs) Absolutely. The ultimate goal is to be in a fulfilling, happy, you know, relationship, at least, you know, um, happiness is really high on, on my chart, you know. 
Yeah. So um, I, th- I think that unfortunately in our culture we're thinking the way we get a man is to be sexy and sexual. And I don't think that really works very well in most cases because the confidence and and has been minimized in terms of how important that is. But being aware of who you are and what works for you is so important, and that's why I'm talking about being your own brand is sexy because it's like having a GPS to help you find your way in a new city. It keeps you from getting lost. It keeps you on track. And I think that's the other thing that can be to help you find the right partner is if you know who you are and what you want, then you're going to end up with somebody who's a little more on the same page than if you're happy to go out with anybody who's maybe super self-centered or or isn't even interested in what you want or into you. Mm-hmm. Now, um, and that kind of brings me to another point. I know that um, you have um, – it's either a quiz or something that people can take that will allow them to determine whether or not they're, you know, the person they're dating is a little bit more into themselves than anyone else. <laughs> I have, yes, I have a um, checklist for your listeners if they, uh, that will help them weed out narcissists and players before they break their hearts. So it's a checklist of things to watch out for because It can be, you know, these narcissistic men can be super attractive and charming, and there can be all kinds of sexual chemistry. So it's really important to be able to pull back a little bit and and make sure you're not getting involved with somebody who's got some big problems that are, it's not going to work out very well in the long run for for these. So they can get that at sexygiveaway.com, sexygiveaway.com. Ooh, I'm going to be signing up for that and checking that out. <laughs> so I think everyone should really um, go over to sexygiveaway.com and um, and really see what that's all about. You know, more information is is always better, and it really helps to identify what it is that you want and what you don't want. And that I, I think a lot of times when people see "Be Your Own Brand of Sexy" as far as the title of the book, they may get confused as far as what that really means. And it, it, you know, from what I've read in this, it's really being able to be comfortable in your own skin and and getting what it is that you want and being sexy as, as a woman in that way. Yes, it's really about figuring out what you want, what works for you as an individual, and what strategies will help you achieve your relationship goals, whatever they may be. And if people aren't sure if they're being their own brand of sexy, I have a quiz on my website that they can take um, to help them figure it out. And, and it will also give you some tips about um, what you might do to help you get what you want better. Mm-hmm. Now, I know in your book you discuss intuition and how that plays a part in dating. Could you share a little bit of that for our listeners? I'd love to. So it's, so I think that sometimes it's hard for us to listen to our intuition. Um, we're more tuned into, do I look right? Does my dress look good? You know, how's my makeup look? Is he happy? You know, um, and and sometimes we forget about ourselves. So then we may be missing out on, gee, you know, he didn't bring his wallet and I'm not comfortable with that. You know, we may be more focused <laughs> on, on, you know, all the external things, you know. I look fat in this dress. And so that makes it really hard to, to say, uh-oh, you know, this guy, or maybe there's some problems with this guy. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's true. If you have good conversation and good chemistry with somebody, then you might be more focused on, uh-oh, is he going to call me again and how do I look? However... If there's some red flags, you don't want to ignore them. So I'm trying to encourage people to tune into that kind of intuition because that usually helps people go in the direction that they want. Well, and I think a lot of times it's so easy, like how you're saying, to get caught up in in the attraction and, you know, is this maybe we're really enjoying ourselves with somebody and then instead of stepping back and looking at, is this really, do we have the same goals in the relationship? Is this really giving me what it is that I need as opposed to, is this what I need right now, you know? 
Yeah, and it's okay. Maybe you can't do that on a day. Maybe you do that when you get home. Um, mm-hmm. As long as you're, you know, not going right to his place, then you have plenty of time to think about that and try and figure it out. Well, and it gives time, and you know, and that's you. You mentioned earlier about you know becoming friends and um, or getting to know the person initially which is a big deal because, I mean, if you're looking at happily ever after, you want to make sure that you actually like the person, you know? And you know what, Marianne, that's such a great point. But even if you're not looking for happily ever after, some of these relationships just don't go well because (laughs) people are getting involved quickly and the guy starts completely taking them for granted, isn't interested, and the woman ends up doing a lot of the work wondering if he's into her or not. That's just not a great dynamic for most women. Well, and and the men really need that chase. And as as women – I think it's it's great to allow that because it, it really does, like you were saying, it shows us how interested they are in us. Yeah, and and many men feel like, well, you know, maybe she's desperate if she's, mm-hmm. you know, they don't they don't necessarily feel like, you know, I have anything to prove here to her. She's, yeah. you know, she she doesn't care if she gets yeah. to know me or not, and. Sometimes they feel like, well, maybe she's sleeping with all the guys like this. And they don't necessarily respect that. Well, Dr. Susan, again, I mean, gosh, I could talk with you all day. I highly encourage our listeners to go out and pick up your book, Be Your Own Brand of Sexy. And I just want to thank you for taking this time and sharing your wisdom and insight with us today. Well, it was my pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. You can learn more about Dr. Susan at her website, BeYourOwnBrandOfSexy.com. Also, there's an opportunity to take a free quiz on Are You Sabotaging Your Chance to Love and Happiness? We will be right back with our next amazing guest after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Moments with Marianne, we are here with another very special guest, Michael Alden. He is author of the best selling book, 5% More. So, Michael's also the CEO of Blue Face Marketing, a multi million dollar marketing firm that has been ranked by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing private firms in America. Alden's also the recipient of Smart CEO Magazine's 2016 Future 50 Award. So, let's welcome to the show, Michael. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Michael. You know, I, I got a hold of your book and had to have you on the show. I mean, this is a hot ticket. Well, you know, we're, we're real excited about it. We're having a lot of fun with it, changing people's lives. People, people seem to really be responding to the 5% more methodology or the 5% more ideology. So, uh, again, we're, we're excited about it. Well, good. Okay, good. And I can see why. I mean, it's, it's a game changer. It really is a game changer. And I know, I mean, I know a little bit about you, and I think most of our listeners probably do already. I mean, you're a CEO of Blue Vase Marketing, you know, multi-million dollar marketing firm. You've, you know, been highlighted in magazines and um, are listed all over the place. You actually have your own podcast as well, so I'm sure people have are very familiar with you and your your work. What inspired you to write this book? 
Well, you know, it's actually uh, it's a great question, kind of a kind of in- interesting story. You know, my first book was titled Ask More, Get More, How to Earn More, Save More, and Live More. We did really well with that. It's number two in Wall Street Journal, number one on Amazon, and sold tens of thousands of copies all over the world. And, you know, I, I, didn't, have a, I didn't have an idea or a plan to write a second book. And about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was in a spinning class. My girlfriend brought me to a spinning class. She says, you've got to check this out. So we're in the spinning class, and I had gone a few few times, and uh, and this one particular class, though, uh, it was about 45 minutes long. And, and if you've ever been in a spinning class, you have the instructor in the front of the room, and they're trying to motivate you, and they're usually playing upbeat music, and that's exactly the atmosphere I was in. And towards the end of the class, she says, look, these last five minutes, 45 minutes class, 45-minute class, these last five minutes, I want you to give me 5% more effort. She said, if you give me 5% more effort, you're going to burn more calories. Your heart rate's going to increase. Um, your metabolic rate's going to increase. When you get off the bike, all those same things are going to continue to happen. Again, you're going to burn more calories just by sitting on the couch, and then ultimately you're going to lead a healthier, happier life. And then she said, anybody can do anything 5% more. And as soon as she said that, I looked around the, looked around the room and there were people of different ages, races, ethnicities. There was a pregnant woman in the class. And one of the interesting things that I noticed is that everybody gave that little extra effort and they probably gave more. As soon as that happened and when the class was over, I got off the bike. I wiped it down, of course, right? Cause that's the, the right thing to do. And then I got in my car and I started writing things down. I said, man, I wonder, I wonder if we could apply this concept of 5% more to different aspects of our life. You know, what would a child's life look like if we read to them just a little bit more? What would a business look like if we gave just a little bit more effort? Or how about, you know, some of the basics of what would your business life look like if you just had 5% more sales or 5% more profit? And that ultimately became what 5% more is today. Mm. Well, and so from what you're saying, it sounds like everyone can can benefit from 5% more. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm a pretty simple guy, and I saw, you know, I see all these other programs out there, and and all these webinars and books and all these other things, and and I, you know, I didn't want to say, you know, people say, well, who's it for? And, you know, you cast this wide net and say, yeah, it's for everybody, but it really is for everybody. It's not necessarily a business book. It's not a lifestyle uh, book in, in in one particular area or a personal development. It really is a methodology, a way of thinking about doing just a little bit more. And I give several examples from all aspects of life. You know, whether you're a high school student looking to get into college and what it takes, you know, on the uh, on the SAT scores or the ACs, depending on what your uh, ACTs, depending on what you're taking, or then even when you're in college and you want to go on and you want to go to law school, you want to go to uh, graduate school. Like, what do you need to do, and what what does your life look like? You know, the difference between an 84 and an 88 is life changing, and that's a five percent difference. It's a B and a B plus, and that changes people's lives. Hmm. And in such a dramatic way, too. I mean, giving that little bit more really does, it, it, it separates kind of the men from the mags, in, in, so to speak, you know? Yeah, I mean, it does. It separates the good from the great. I mean, when you look at... When you look at successful people like I have, you know, so many people, you know, get to the, to the very edge of success and then they stop and they give up. You know, in my book, I don't spend a lot of time talking about this, but really what happens is it's the last 5% that really separates the good from the great. So, you know, when we talk about giving a little bit more effort on whatever aspect of your life um, that you need to, it really then comes down to when you get to the very end, it's that little extra push. You know, I give the example if you're a runner and you're running down the street and, you know, sometimes when I'm exercising, I might say to myself, well, I'm, you know, maybe two more minutes or one more minute. Or if you're on the street, you say, you know, maybe this next telephone pole or the next block. And then you just do it again and again. You know, I was on a, a radio show recently and, and uh, the gentleman said to me, he's a, he's a cold water swimmer. I didn't know there was such a thing. He's a cold water swimmer. He said, Mike, I gave myself a, a, a time of 20 minutes. And then it became 22, and then it became 24, and then it became up to 29. And then he said to himself, well, I have to at least finish off at 30. So that's really all it is. It's a way to think. It's a way to train our brains. And here's the other thing. I had mentioned all these other programs and books and all these other things that are out there, and a lot of them tell us that we need to be 10 times better than everybody else. We need to be 100% on 100% of the time. And scientifically, the way our bodies are, are made up, you know, our physiologies, we cannot sustain that. The 5% more, the gradual steps, the compounding on those micro successes over time is what really works and really what allows us to have long-term sustainable success and growth. Well, I know you mentioned your book, that's where most self-help books fail, is because they're looking for these dynamic changes that it's like, you know, you've got to change everything. Where your book, it's, it's these increments. 
Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, you look at so many different things, you know, from a sales perspective. You know, I think so many sales organizations uh, make a big mistake by setting these giant goals that are unrealistic. And what they do is, is then they, you know, they, dis- they disenfranchise people. They don't make them happy. And then ultimately, you know, they're constantly just missing their goals. And it's just not a, it's not a fun thing. But whereas I say, look, if you just set your goals to be 5% greater than what you did the day before or the week before or the month before, whatever it is, and then you compound on that, you know, over time, it can be a huge increase in whatever it is you know you're trying to do so again a lot of these people out there try to make try to give us this you know this wholesale change and we know just from the diet industry that it doesn't work but again scientifically and i talk about it i'm not a science guy but i talk about it in the book a little bit the way our brains work the way our anatomies work we cannot maintain that for a long period of time however we can make those micro steps those micro changes over time and then it becomes what it becomes habit and then once it becomes habit it becomes easy Mm, you're such a dynamo. I mean, I, I could talk with you on this subject all day long. <laughs> yeah. So, what are some of the things that our audience members can do to go ahead and get five percent more, like let's just say, success in their business life? You know, it's funny. Success is a relative term. You know, success to me and, to, and success to you might be different things. And I define success quite simply: it's whatever you want it to be. Okay. So, if you want the the classic you know, white picket fence in the, you know, in the family and the dog and the nice house and be able to go to Disney World once in a while. If that's what you want and you get there, then good for you. That, you know, that, that to me uh, is success, you know. And so when, they, when people say, you know, I've had that question posed to me before, like, you know, what can you give a concrete thing of what you can do? And this is really, really, really simple. And I even mentioned this in the introduction of the book. Whatever it is you're trying to do and whatever you're trying to be, quote, successful at, you know, I mentioned the last 5%. It truly is just giving that little bit of extra effort. And I give example of an, an example, an example within the book, and I have people now constantly tweeting me and texting me and all these things saying, Mike, you know, I, I was about to leave the office today, but I sent one more email out, and that email then turned into a sale. Or I made one more phone call, or I knocked on one more door, or, or I spoke to one more person, and that really does separate the good from the great. It's that simple. But the thing is, is though, is that... You know, I also want to talk about simplicity. I'm a pretty simple guy, and I learned this, you know, a few years ago in a yoga class of all places. And at the end of the class, she said, simple things work, but only if you do them. The 5% more mentality, the 5% more book, the 5% more philosophy is something that truly anybody can do and apply it to any aspect of their lives. And that's why I'm so excited about it, because I am frustrated with all these other things out there that most people can't do. Can I be 10 times uh, greater every single day? Probably, but I, I, I'm going to burn out too. Most people can't do that. Anybody can, like, just back to the, the back to the spinning class, anybody can do anything 5% more. Seems like you get some great inspiration when you're working out here. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's, I mean, that, it's funny you say that. I mean, that, that's where it all happens, right? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, there's so many things, you know, because you give yourself a little bit of extra effort, and when you give yourself a little bit of extra effort, again, I'm not a science guy, but I know enough to be dangerous, what happens is this chemicals, hormones are released in your body, like oxytocin, that, that, that allows your brain to thrive. More oxygen is going to your brain, so your ideas start to come. You know, I also, <laughs> there's my accent right there, I, you know, I also get a lot of great ideas from meditation. I talk about meditation in the book and how we should maybe slow down. Five percent more. Take a deep breath. Five percent more. Step back and look at what what our lives are really like, and, and maybe just slow down and be five percent more. Mm. Well, you know, Mike, I wish I could have you on um, if just for a longer period of time because I, I really feel your book is a game changer, and I know it works. I mean, I've used these principles before, and it's so good to see them um, just in, in the way that you formatted this, so that way. People can, t- you know, pick this up and start making dramatic changes in their lives. You know, so do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, you know, that's the last thing what you said. You know, when we talk about dramatic changes, you know, the cover of my book, it says making small changes to achieve extraordinary results. Here's the thing. You know, when they think, you know, we had a, I, I was, you know, I, I was really thinking about whether or not we were going to do that, put that on the cover of the book. It doesn't have to be an extraordinary change in your life. It can be the little simple things, and then you compound on them over time, and, and you adapt it to whatever your life is. So, you know, the basic most fundamental thing is you pick up the book, whether it's my book or whatever, and you make the decision that you're going to make those wholesale changes, excuse me, you make the decision that you're going to make those changes. And, you know, change is uh, something that we all kind of resist. But the fact of the matter is the only thing that's constant in life is change, right? So let's make a small change over time so that you can get to that, quote, success, whatever it is you want. Oh, perfect. And where can our listeners find you? 
Uh, so you can find me at uh, michael-alden.com. You can find me on Twitter and uh, Instagram and Snapchat. It's Mike Alden 2012. You can also find me on Facebook. It is forward slash the Alden Report. Okay, and then they can also go to your website so they can listen to your podcast and um, be involved with your community there, sign up for your newsletter, and, of course, go purchase 5% more. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today, Michael. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And for our listeners, we'll be right back after these messages. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Ben Wexler is a gifted leadership development and strategy consultant for professionals who want to transform their organizations and careers. Through a uniquely personalized set of processes, participants discover their unique knowledge, how to leverage that knowledge and experience, and then put it all together with a global strategy. You're more valuable, your organization is more valuable, and the change is viral. Contact Ben at 630-881-1074. 630-881-1074. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We are here with our next special guest, Alea Dow, and she's here to talk to us about her new albums, that she just released, and she's got a couple of special surprises, free giveaways for us today. So welcome to the show, Alea. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Oh, it's so fabulous to have you here. I'm so happy to hear about your music albums that just came out. Yes, we've been working on them, um, I mean, literally over a decade, and I think in that time, I have completed eight albums so far. We we are yet to release the eighth one. We'll do that over the holidays. But it's been such a process of evolution for me and how I create music, what comes through, and the focus of the music that I create is really a multidimensional experience, and it's all about balancing the energy fields, awakening the spirit, helping us cultivate a deeper level of connection inside ourselves so that we have the capacity to connect to a deeper degree in a more authentic way with other people in our life and with the beings in the higher realms, the angelic presence that surrounds us every day. Well, I have been blessed to be able to participate in the tall cups that you do, you have cups of consciousness that I subscribe to. Can you explain to our listeners a little bit what sound healing is all about? Yeah, I actually think that all of us are sound healers in our very own unique way. Some of us might use our voice to soothe ourselves. We might hum. We might pick particular music that we want to listen to that can help us bring um bring in greater peace and balance and clarity or inspiration. This morning when I was waking up out of my beautiful, dreamy state, I realized that some people listen to heavy metal in the morning to get themselves going, whereas I might listen to the birds. And and so every time we pick consciously or unconsciously a sound, what we're doing and music to expose ourselves to is we are shifting our energy fields whether we know it or not. We're shifting our mood, and so I really think of music as medicine. Mm. Well, and and it really can be. You know, they talk about music being the language of the soul, and I think you have that down in spades. I mean, you just you know how to <laughs> look, and I, I just have been amazed with the sessions that I've had with you that you really can look at a spirit. And a, and a person and kind of see where they are in their journey and help them make those changes. It's a, it's a lot of personal responsibility, and I've always really appreciated that about your path. Well, I think of everybody in their process, their journey, spiritually growing and evolving, almost as like a sound. And sometimes when we're struggling or challenged, it's a discordant sound. And so when I'm working with people, 
what I actually first tune into are the sounds that they are emitting, their body is emitting, their soul is emitting, their team, the angelic presence that surrounds them is emitting. And then I tune into, okay, so there's that sound that's coming from them. What could be an even more supportive, higher vibrational, more connected, empowered sound that they could be emitting? And then I bring in energetic t- protocols or tones, light language, energetic activations to help each individual move and embrace the sound that they truly have the capacity to to hold in a very sustainable way that's in greater alignment with their essence. Mm. And what a delicious place to be in, you know, it's it is. really being yes. aligned fully. Wait, I, I've got, we've got to dive into these albums. I, mean, I was so excited about your lullabies. And they're not just, I mean, most people hear lullabies and think, oh, that's for kids, but I, this is for everybody. Can you kind of, yeah. you know, talk on this a little bit and what inspired you to, you know, get this album together? When I tune into the music that is being emitted in the higher realms by the angelic presence, there's there's what I, I call light language. It's the universal language that all of our souls understand, whether we speak English or Hebrew or Italian or Spanish or Latin or German. We all understand at a soul level the light language. And so the light language is in the lullabies, and it's all about remembering your essence, remembering why you came here into this world, tapping into your gifts, your wisdom, and your mastery that you've been cultivating for lifetimes, and then holding that inside yourself as you move in the world. When um, these light language lullaby songs are heard by children, then they start to remember and anchor in their wisdom and mastery to a deeper degree, and they don't go through the forgetting phase that most of us go through um, as deeply. They might forget a little bit, but it's really this you know, remember yourself and keep holding yourself. And so people could actually be listening to this at the age of one and then five and then 10 and then 20, the same song over and over again, maybe once a month to remind themselves of the purpose for their life in a way that is incredibly fulfilling. How that changes as, you know, we we grow is such a big deal, too. So when we come into the world, from my perspective, we have very particular vibrations that we hold in what I call our inner river of light, our divine line. And there are qualities that we as souls have attained in this inner river of light. And so the journey as a one-year-old or a two-year-old or a five-year-old or a ten-year-old or a twenty-year-old is to really connect vibrationally with this inner wisdom and mastery and model that in the world. So often when we're growing up, we get attached to what other people are doing or we look for validation, respect, love, support externally instead of finding that deep within. So it's really about living in a healthy co-creative way and not taking on patterns that aren't in alignment with our essence. Now we've got, you know, gosh, we got to talk about your other album, and you've got several, but Open Doors album. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? That is a creation that George Friedenthal, who is my pianist, musician, the synthesizing background in music, he and I have been working on that for about two years, and we just released it um, middle of 2016, and it's this beautiful collection. It's almost like a, a symphony of sounds, and then I have my toning and my light language that is laid into his music. And I'm always amazed in the creation process that when I'm in the recording studio laying down these vocals, I'll actually lay a track down and then we'll mute that track. Then I'll lay down another track and we'll mute those two tracks. Then I'll lay down another track. And then we listen to these three tracks that I've laid down on top of the music. And there's this harmony that I energetically, unconsciously am tuning into and the exact same light language phrases at the exact same point three times in a row. And so it's just this, I love creating the music, and then the end result is great, but it's that juice of being in the studio, listening to the angelic realm, and then being able to lay these these transmissions and activations down in the physical plane. That is fascinating to hear that that's how that comes about. I mean, I've listened to your albums and your music for years now, and it's it's out of this world. It's absolutely fabulous. And I would never guess that that's the process that you take to develop that. 
Yes, and then this newest album, um, Across the Meadow Sky, was actually done in a slightly different way with, um, I have two people that I work with creating my music, George and Robinson, Robinson Eikenberry. And what he does is he creates beds of music um, when he's in the studio, and then I'll come into the studio and he'll say, okay, I've created four beds of music for you. Are you ready? And I'm like, yep, I'm ready. So I've never heard what he's created in the physical realm, these beautiful beds of music, and I put my headset on, and I stand in front of the mic, and I lay down one track, two tracks, three tracks, completely improvising, never heard it before, and essentially doing the same thing that I've done with George's music. George's music I've heard before. Robinson's I haven't, and and – there it is. And so then we work with those three tracks, and again, it's me singing the exact same phrase, different harmonic tones that layer perfectly at the exact same time. It's just this extraordinary experience. Oh, what a wonderful combination that all is, you know, yeah. being able to, um, I mean, because I've, I've heard your music, I would have never guess that's how you do it. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds so angelic and so perfect. And you know, one thing I've, you know, there are many things I appreciate about your work that you do, but I, I, it resonates with me when I've done sessions with you and I've listened to your music or done the tall cuts or attended an event. I can actually feel what it is that you're shifting and moving, but it, again, it's not you that's doing it, it's us that's making those shifts, and I just love yeah. how you do that work. And and for me, I think that what the, the reason that I'm able to do that work is that I maintain my awareness, my attachment, my focus, not in the physical dimension, but actually in the higher planes where we are being patterned from. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm taking my cue from that higher experience or the higher dimensional reality, there is this beautiful, amazing timing and thinking and um, alignment and resonance, and so it becomes this multi-dimensional experience. So, where can our listeners um, connect with you and purchase these albums? They can go to Amazon. I have a few of my albums there. They can also go to aleyadao.com, A-L-E-Y-A-D-A-O.com to access the seven albums and soon the eighth album. And actually, um, seven albums on my website, Sounds True, has released my um, my second album called Light Body Sound Healing. And so you can actually get that on Sounds True or Amazon. Ooh, I'm going to hop over there and pick that up right now because that is one I don't have, but I will in a minute. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I know that you have a special gift uh, gift for our listeners. Yes, I would love to gift all of your listeners with a free week of Daily Cups of Consciousness. They're audio meditations with sound healing and energetic protocols. And they can also get a free sample tall cup session, which is a 45-minute energy balancing session to help you move into greater balance, peace, clarity, calm. And you can go to cupsofconsciousness.com to get that free week and that trial of the tall cups or go to aleadow.com. Thank you so much for your time today, Leah. We greatly appreciate having you here. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.